Thank you very much, Ken, David, and Cork. Um, I think this is helping to us to understand the real difference between the um, actual scientific method and what's been going on. I have the happy alternative task of telling you about a success story, about somebody who got it right. And that is well worth being proud of, and it shows there is a pathway to really doing climate science correctly if only we could get past some of the obstacles that are there in the public, but really aren't there in the science. But the science needs to be made clear, and of course that's what this, today's panel is about. Um, now let's see. So I called the talk, my little presentation here, Getting It Right, because it's so important that that be a cornerstone of what we think about and what we plan to do. <clears throat> What I've got is an example of how there can be good agreement between a model and actual scientific data. And the example is a paper um, put out by uh, William Van Weingarten from Canada and Will Happer, our own Will Happer, who's part of our team here today and has been for many years. And it's about the effects of the um, uh, all the different greenhouse gases, which include one, water, two, CO2, and then three, several trace gases, such as um, methane and nitrous oxide, and not to be overlooked is ozone, which counts because it's important up in the stratosphere. But their work actually agrees with experiment, and that's what's important. This is an abstract of their paper, and I defy anybody to read that little tiny print. But there are certain characteristics that are important in, uh, and reported in the abstract. And here's several of the things. Okay. First of all, um, I'm having trouble reading it myself. Uh, names the five gases. Okay. Second, their calculations employed over one-third million lines. It's a calculation that begins with what's called the HITRAN database, which is all the spectral lines of all these gases. Remember, John Tyndall got started in this in 1859, and boy, have other guys really continued it over the intervening centuries. These calculations were not done on a great big billion-dollar mainframe machine. They managed to do them on a laptop. That's pretty good. It shows you the incredible advances of modern computer technology. But here's what's going on. Every one of these five molecules, on a per molecule basis, has roughly about the same uh, emission power, which is usually measured in watts, and the numbers are about 10 to the minus 22 watts. It's the same for all of these uh, molecules, whether it be CO2 or H2O or, or N2O or any of these. But what goes on is that because of saturation, that is because there's so much water and so much CO2, uh, the effective amount is suppressed. That's the word. It's suppressed by like four orders of magnitude. Even the methane is suppressed to some extent. But what you have is an effect that these other uh, minor league gases, the trace gases, look important compared to H2O and CO2 on a per molecule basis, but or they look comparable anyway. But when you put a real atmosphere together with a percent or so of H2O and 400 parts per million of CO2, then the major greenhouse gases dominate everything. So, among other things, they calculated the surface temperature, which is due to doubling of CO2. It goes under the name of climate sensitivity, and everybody cares about that. Doubling the concentration increases the forcing by a few percent. That's the kind of number Howard just showed you of like 3.7, that kind of thing, 3.7 watts per square meter. That's what doubling actually does. But the calculation by Van Weingarten and Happer really did show that. So 
The final line of that unreadable abstract was that satellite spectral measurements at various latitudes are in excellent quantitative agreement with modeled intensities. That is one whopping big important statement about science. Let's go to the next slide. Now this looks tough to read, okay? But what you're looking at in the left column is their model. And what you're looking at in the right column is experimental data as seen by satellites. Remember, you couldn't do this before about 1979 when the uh, weather satellites first went up. So the data there on the right side didn't exist a half century ago. But look at the numbers on the left, or look at the shape of the curves on the left. The top one is for rather dry conditions in the Sahara Desert. The middle one is for sort of what we call normal life, the Mediterranean, which is about the same latitude as we are. And the bottom one is for Antarctica. Well, you look at that thin little red line on the top, that's the Stefan Boltzmann curve. That's what you would get with no greenhouse gases at all. So, at low frequency, that is, um, I'm sorry, low energy equals um, high. This scale is in wave numbers, okay? We get so used to talking wavelength that we shouldn't. Wave numbers is the right scale. Your low energy radiation is largely attenuated by H2O. But then you come to the vicinity around 667 inverse centimeters, which also equals 15 microns. And there's this big dent in the curve due to carbon dioxide. And that's its contribution to the greenhouse gas effect. Then there's a place in which you almost hit the um, Stefan Boltzmann curve, which means none of these gases are absorbing. And that's what we refer to as the atmospheric window which is sort of a little above 10 microns or a little below 10, uh, 1,000 inverse centimeters. Then as you go out further to the right of the graph, you begin to see that absorption by water once again pulls the curve down away from the Stefan Boltzmann line, showing there's real absorption. And there's a little blip there for N2O, and with the best really microscopic inspection, you might find a little bit from methane, CH4. So now look at what happens on your comparison from left to right in the top row. It's remarkably good. It's incredibly good. This is what the paper says is called excellent quantitative agreement. Then you jump to another latitude, the typical Mediterranean, and look at the middle two curves, left and right, and that is, once again, the same thing where water is absorbing in the low energies. CO2 is important in the vicinity of uh, 600 and, and so um, inverse centimeters. And then water becomes important again after you've passed through the atmospheric window. And the most impressive thing at all, I think, is the bottom pair. That's Antarctica. Remember, we're talking in the left column, we're talking calculation. Okay, the right column is satellite data. So what's going on there is that the radiation that is calculated by them and observed but from the satellites is greater than the Stefan Boltzmann curve. Well, how can you get greater than that? And the answer is that the atmosphere above Antarctica is radiating more than the icy surface below. So you've got a Stefan Boltzmann curve that's like 193 Kelvin. That's incredibly cold, you know, really, really, A to below zero sort of thing. And, but the radiation is greater. And when I saw that agreement, even in the Antarctic case, between theory and experiment, the conclusion is inescapable, is they really nailed it. They got it right. We've got, at last, a theory that really works. So, what we find is that when you've got such good agreement, at last you can believe the theory.
IPCC, nobody believes it because it doesn't agree with measurements. But these calculations really do agree with measurement. And that's the right use of the scientific method. That's what we're here for. That's what IPC cares about. That's what Heartland cares about. That's what all of us in the room and in this, in this um, uh, collection of colleagues care about is using the scientific method correctly. And they did. So here's what happens when you've got a theory that you can count on. Now you can do numerical experiments. You can fiddle around and change the amount of CO2, double it, have it, do away with it completely. You can change H2, um, uh, CH4, etc. And you don't have to rely upon these artificially invented numbers such as global warming potential, which I'm sure you've read about alleges that um, uh, methane is about 30 times more important to greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. Well, no, you don't have to trust in that kind of uh, extraneous thinking. So in the next slide, you see what happens with CO2. Now here, folks, you've got to squint a little bit to see this, but I hope it's clear. The black line is the reality of today in their calculation. That is 400 parts per million CO2. Again, the faint little blue line is the Stefan Boltzmann line. And look at the green line, which cuts across the top. That's the case of zero CO2. If there weren't any CO2, you'd get the green line. So when you kind of eyeball the figure and look at uh, the absorption of water, the absorption of everything else, you can see that CO2 kind of counts for about 25%, or about a quarter of the greenhouse effect. So nobody says CO2 is completely negligible, by no means. It's an important contributor to the greenhouse effect. But the green shows you what happens when you've got zero CO2, and you compare that with a real curve, which is black. Now, for those of you with magnifying glass in your hand and good eyeglasses, look at the red curve. That's CO2 doubled. And you can barely see there's any difference between the black curve and the red curve. Little tiny blips down along the edge of the carbon dioxide dent, a couple things like that. Almost very hard to see. And by the way, if you look for either methane or N2O in there, you've got awfully good eyesight. Okay? So, but these numerical experiments are how we learn. From this, we can learn what's really going on. So now if we do the actual case of considering methane changing, once again, with green, we can do zero methane. We can do, with a red, doubled methane, okay? Can anybody see anything? Remember, the absorption, the total energy you absorb is the integral under the curve, the difference between what was there before and what you've got now. And really little tiny blips are so small that they can't matter very much. And if you ask, well, hey, methane's supposed to be so powerful, why can't we see it? And the answer is because there's so much water in the air anyway that water is what's absorbing in the vicinity that methane absorbs. For those of you who are tired of squinting and can't find it, Methane's absorption is at about 1365 inverse centimeters. Um, so it's um, kind of over to the right in the place where, among other things, there isn't that much black body energy anyway. But this is a really good example of the whole methane story and why real people doing real science aren't too worried about it. But you know, I've got colleagues in New Zealand that are in terrible shape with their government trying to suppress methane. Because New Zealand's a place with four million people and 33 million sheep. And that's what their life is down there, is taking care of animals. And um, so the farmers there are taking a terrible beating at the hands of a government that is on a big kick against methane. Well, let's go on. So here's the uh, basic results that are important. If CO2 were zero, it would make a big difference, about 25%, and the Earth would, in fact, be cooler. 
So CO2 is a contributor to the greenhouse effect, definitely. But if CO2 were doubled, it would make only a very small difference. Um, you heard uh, Howard say 3.7. Uh, watts per square centimeter, 3.0 is another number that's being thrown about, but the particular differences due to doubling CO2 is just very, very small indeed. And as you've just seen from these graphs, both CH4, methane, and N2O, nitrous oxide, incredibly hard to find, and clearly they don't contribute to the greenhouse effect at all. They are negligible, they are irrelevant, and that's important. Oh, by the way, molecules of very tiny concentration have even less effect. Uh, HFCs, uh, uh, hydrofluorocarbons from air conditioners and so forth, has been a subject of a topic of interest because the guys who did the so-called global warming potential calculations got these ridiculously high numbers for the HFCs above 1,000, and that caused people to say, oh my God, it's a terrible greenhouse gas. It's not. The amount of gas really matters, and these trace gases don't contribute to the greenhouse effect. So scientifically, we got certain conclusions. Agreement between theory and experiment is the hallmark of good science. And if you want a slogan for what the Science and Environmental Policy Project stands for, Fred Singer, Fred Seitz before him, that sentence states right there is what we're all about. And we're happy to say, this is today's big success story, that the work of Van Weingarten and Happer meets that criteria. Their model works. And it's far superior to the general circulation model results that are featured in the IPCC reports, which always predict too high temperatures. And you saw from Corkaden's presentation how ridiculous that is. So more CO2 makes only a tiny difference. More nitrous oxide and methane make no difference at all. And finally, there's what we might call uh, the policy implications which are um, fairly clear at, at once. You gotta acknowledge that they got it right. When you see agreement like that between a model and the experimental or observational data from satellites, you gotta say they got it right. And this is in a really top of the class of type of agreement between theory and experiment. So you should believe the results of Van Weingarten and Happer instead of believing in the IPCC and especially the IPP summary for policymakers, which aren't even written by scientists. And the conclusion therefore is, do not take expensive actions to mitigate climate change. And do not strive to reduce CO2 or the other greenhouse gases. And that's the conclusion.